Oh, look. Hello. Thank you. Warren, I ought to walk into rooms with you more often. That feels pretty good. Oh. <laughs> I don't usually get greeted I like that. thought it was that. you. I was... <laughs> uh, so, Warren, congratulations on uh, Ashes and Dust. Uh, Thank you. New, uh, new direction, obviously. It's been, I think, really well received for good reason. Um, and, you know, when, when most of us first got to know you or heard about you, it was either when you were first in the Dickie Betts band or a few years later when you were a member of the Allman Brothers band. So we first got to know you really as a guitar player. And then it was sort of, oh, wow, he also sings, he writes songs. Um, and obviously that's a much bigger part of what you do than that. And I just wondered, if, if that had never happened, if you hadn't hooked up with Dickie and started your career nationally that way, do you think we would have known this side of you a long time ago? Uh, I don't know. I mean, singing and songwriting and guitar playing are all equally important important to me and always have been, but I tend to write a lot of songs in different directions. Um, in the case of Ashes and Dust, a lot of songs that started on acoustic guitar that are folk music influenced, uh, maybe coming from more of a singer-songwriter standpoint. Um, I've been writing those kind of songs all my life. I don't know that I ever would have made that type of record, but I probably would have at some point. Uh, Joining the Allman Brothers changed the trajectory of my career extremely. And so there's no way for me to even second guess what might have happened because uh, my world changed so much from that point forward. What was your perception of yourself before that as more of a guitar player or, or was it always sort of all equal and all of well, the above? I always tell people that I wanted to be in a band where I was the singer-songwriter or one of the singer-songwriters, or I wanted to be a solo artist, one of those two things. And both of those things eventually had a way of working out. Right. And the, the origins of Ashes and Dust actually were, were a record you were hoping to do with Leon Russell and uh, T-Bone Wolk and Levon Helm, right? Well, about, I guess, six or seven years ago, I was planning to do a record with Levon and Leon Russell and a bass player named T-Bone Walk that you mentioned. Um, uh, T-Bone passed away first, and then Levon passed away, and that record kind of disintegrated. But some of these songs would probably have been on that record. They would have been approached a little bit differently. But uh, some of the songs definitely go back that far, and I think were in my mind to record uh, with that unit, so to speak. But then I've been continuing to write a lot of songs since then that kind of fall in this direction as well. Uh, what ended up happening when that record uh, dissolved was that I made Man in Motion, which was more like a soul music meets blues sort of record because I had accumulated a lot of songs in that direction as well. You told me before that when you recorded this album with Railroad Earth, well, let me back up first. Was it important to you to, to have a band like Railroad Earth rather than, I mean, obviously you could have put together four or five or six great individual musicians, but is there something that happens with a band that, that's different that you wanted on this? Well, I kind of accidentally discovered that I had a good chemistry with those guys, but they, more importantly, probably uh, have a great chemistry of their own. So I wanted to take advantage, uh, advantage of the fact that they had this conversational approach to playing music where it wasn't so structured. There was just a lot of bobbing and weaving and, and call and response. That's the way I love to play music. So I think the fact that they have their chemistry has a lot to do with the music on this record. Um, the fact that we had chemistry together uh, was a bonus, and that's what made me want to make the record with those guys. Uh, it doesn't mean that we couldn't have made a great record or an, even an equally great record with a bunch of uh, musicians who had never played together before. It would just been different. But I was inspired by the chemistry that they had and, and wanted to utilize it. And you, and you told me that you didn't really want those guys to have the songs and rehearse them and nail them for weeks. You wanted, the, you wanted to capture, because you like the dynamic of what happens the first few times someone plays a song. 
Can you describe that more? Because most people don't approach recording that way. Well, I, I wanted to capture the feeling that you get when musicians play a song for the first time. There's something very special about that. And since these songs are all coming from like a, a folk music direction, they're not super complicated. The arrangements are not super complicated. Uh, I thought the music would benefit from that sort of approach. And I mentioned it to the guys before we started recording, and they were like, yeah, that sounds great, let's do it. So each day we would go into the studio, and I would pick up an acoustic guitar and show the guys a song that they had never heard. We would talk about instrumentation, we would talk about the arrangement, take whatever arrangement I already had and expand upon it if necessary and start recording. And if we felt like we had a good version, we'd move on to another song that they had never heard before. And, and if you didn't have a good version, you know, if it felt like it wasn't happening or they weren't picking it up, did you move on and then sometimes double back to it the next day or another session? Not usually. Usually we uh, were able to keep the early takes uh, of everything. Um, I'm trying to think if there was an exception, but uh, if it wasn't coming immediately, then that would probably mean we would spend a little more time uh, tracking the song than we wanted to. But I, that didn't really happen for the most part either. I, I do remember one song, like showing it to the guys and in the middle of showing it to them going, no, let's skip this one. Let's do something else. Uh, but everything we tackled, we pretty much nailed. And there's a few songs that you played late at night on purpose because you wanted to capture a late night vibe, right? Could you talk about what, which songs those were and, and what that vibe is and how, how that's different? Well, uh, the song Hallelujah Boulevard, which we recorded fairly early into the process, uh, was the first one, I think, that took on uh, that approach. Basically, I, I went to the guys in advance and said, there are a few songs that I think would benefit from us recording them very late at night, like midnight, which is later than we were normally even recording. Uh, some nights we were there till midnight, but uh, they all ag agreed, and so... I like to do things in threes. So uh, we did three takes of Hallelujah Boulevard starting around midnight. And then we went home. We didn't listen back to the recording. Came in the next day and listened back to the three takes and said, oh, that one's really good. Uh, and that, that's a live uh, performance. Even the vocal is live. We didn't add anything to that. Um, we also did Gold Dust Woman that way. And, and were you and Grace singing that together? No, we, Grace and I sang it, I think maybe the next day or something, we came in and sang it together. I just did a scratch vocal while we were recording. Uh, but we did stand side by side and sing it together, which is what we wanted to do. Um, and then there, were, there was a third song that is not on Ashes and Dust that will probably be on the next record that we recorded that way as well. You know, years ago we did that interview together with uh, James Hetfield of Metallica for, for Guitar World, right, with uh, you and Woody and, and James. And if you remember, uh, one of the things that James, that, that was when Dose was getting ready to come out, from yeah. Government Mule, and James Hetfield was just blown away and sort of in awe that you had recorded most of your solos live. And he seemed almost um, jealous, you know, that you had carved out a, a way to make music that way that that was you know he, he thought was really cool but couldn't quite imagine having done it but is that approach that that you know that you're talking about recording live recording the vocals live even you know recording your solos live I mean I don't know if most people realize that that's not how things are usually done these days but um, is that just part of your love of of because that's the the music you loved was recorded that way and you wanted to convey the same immediacy or yeah, I think the, uh, most of the music that I love was recorded that way. It's also my love for improvisation. And I think if you're going to approach uh, music in an improvisational way, you, can, you have to do it at the same time. Uh, it doesn't mean that you won't have good results doing it one person at a time. 
It just won't be the same. It won't have that spirit and that call and response, which is the lifeblood of our music. There's a lot of great music that gets recorded in a more modern way where they do the drums, then they add the bass, then they add the piano, then they add the guitar, and that's just, it's boring, and it doesn't appeal to me. To, to uh, clarify, do you, you mean boring to record or to listen to the music? But, but, <laughs> now, but I should clarify that there's a lot of great music that's done that way, and music that I love that's done that way. I just have the choice, and I don't want to do right, music that way because what I prefer uh, is more spontaneous and more improvisational. And I think for my music, it benefits from recording it uh, with a more old school approach. Right. But there, there's a huge uh, distance between uh, Hallelujah Boulevard and Thorazine Shuffle, but they're both recorded with that same <laughs> approach, right? Because you yeah. don't think of Hallelujah Boulevard as an improv, but it's still improv in, in, the, in the looseness of the performance. Well, right? the, the thing that I think is beautiful about the, that recording of Hallelujah Boulevard is that no one is playing a repeating pattern. No one's thought about what they're going to play. They're just playing music at midnight. Uh, and that's what I was trying to capture. I, uh, one of my favorite records is Astral Weeks, the Van Morrison record. They did that record in a day and a half. A day and a half they recorded that entire record. And there are mistakes on that record. There are parts where it's out of tune, out of time. It's beautiful. I wouldn't change one thing about it. And so right before uh, we recorded Hallelujah Boulevard, I said, just think Astral Weeks. And that's all I said. Nobody had to ask, what does that mean? Everybody was familiar. And the introduction is so ethereal and, and dreamlike that it kind of defies uh, modern song structures, even defies what the song is going to be. You really don't know what is coming when you hear that introduction. And the way those guys played uh, throughout that song, uh, I don't think there's one part repeated even though it's simple uh, chord structure and melodies, it's just like flowing and, and, uh, and, and without structure. And that's what I was looking for. And that's one of the things that those guys do really, really well. And, and that's what I wanted to capture. Um, there, and, and so you recorded that with Road Earth. You've played a bunch of shows with them. And now you're going to be continuing the Ashes and Dust Tour, but no longer with Road Road Earth. So could you tell us a little bit about the new band? you've put together and who these guys are? Well, uh, starting with Jeff Sipe, who is uh, one of my favorite drummers. Uh, Jeff did the uh, symphonic celebration tour with me where I did the music of Jerry Garcia with a symphony. Uh, we've been friends for a long, long time. Uh, Jeff's uh, an amazing player. And he and I have been wanting to play together for quite a long time. Uh, uh, Bela Fleck turned me on to these guys called Chess Boxer, these young bluegrass, newgrass, jazzy sort of uh, musicians that are just really fresh and unique, and, and uh, I fell in love with their approach to the music right off the bat. So I got this idea to combine Chess Boxer and Jeff Sipe and myself and these songs, and then we're also going to be adding a lot of new songs and other songs that we haven't done yet and stuff. So I think the new Ashes and Dust Band is going to be similar to what I've been doing with Railroad Earth, maybe a little jazzier, and we're going to pull out some instrumental songs that I uh, haven't done in a while, and, and some, some of my songs and some covers that, that make sense, try to uh, keep adding to the repertoire and shaking things up. And I'm looking, to, looking forward to seeing where it all goes, because with the the Railroad Earth Tour, we knew it was going to be short and finite, so we didn't really have a chance to concentrate too much on adding songs to the repertoire, where this is going to be going till next summer. So we're just going to keep adding and adding and adding. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, over the years, there's been you've had songs in your repertoire that could have that could fit in here. I can I can imagine some easily, and 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 that you Write know. Them down for me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I'm looking. If you had written them at a different time, might have been on this album. But one that we were we were talking about a little bit was "Lay of the Sunflower," uh, from the Deep End, which you you wrote with Robert Hunter. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of that song uh, and 
and if it was intimidating at all to take Robert Hunter's lyrics and, and interpret them into, into a Warren Haynes song? Uh, it was a beautiful challenge. Uh, I was talking to, to Phil Lesh one day, and he said uh, that he was speaking to Hunter, and Hunter said to tell me that if I wanted to take any of his lyrics in this lyric book that he has that of songs that had not been uh, published as music and lyrics, uh, that I had his permission to do so. And I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. So I was looking through the book, and I saw the lyric for Lay of the Sunflower, and, and the music and the melody and everything just kind of popped into my head. And uh, uh, it came very quickly, and I told Phil that. And he said, yeah, uh, Jerry used to say the same thing, that when he looked at Hunter's lyrics, uh, music would pop into his head, and it would come very quickly. And... Uh, so I decided to record that when we were doing the Deep End record with Phil playing bass and with David Grisman playing mandolin. As you mentioned, it's kind of a precursor to Ashes and Dust because it's one of the earliest recordings that represent this direction for me. Uh, I was going back recently through some interviews we did 15, 16 years ago when you were just starting to play with Phil. And you were sort of astounded by how challenging it was and the way he would throw curveballs at you. And I'm wondering, at now after so many years and so many gigs with him, do you still have that feeling that, uh, of him keeping you on your toes more than anybody else? Well, I've uh, gotten used to expecting the unexpected, I guess. Uh, but, you know, Phil and I really enjoy working together. Um, I think... The biggest lesson learned from that whole uh, process is that the way he looks at the music, like there is no uh, expectation for it, there is no right or wrong, uh, there's no limitations, it's all about being in the moment and more so than the rest of us who have talked about being in the moment our entire lives ever thought about, meaning that Wherever the music goes, it doesn't matter if it's completely different than where you hoped or even wanted it to go. It's cool and it's going to be great and it is what it is and you don't place any pressure on that. And I think that's a beautiful concept and a beautiful way of looking at the music. Uh, he looks at music like there's, he always says there's no mistakes, only missed opportunities. And I think that's a good way of looking at things because musicians tend to worry way too much about mistakes. Uh, and the audience doesn't hear a mistake the way we hear it when we make it. A lot of my favorite records had mistakes on them when I was growing up listening uh, to music, but they didn't sound like mistakes to me. They were mistakes that I learned 10, 20, 30 years later, oh, that's a mistake. But when I was a young listener enamored with that music, it was just something beautiful, and it was just part of what I was hearing. And so after you hear a, a hundred of those, you start realizing that to take that away from music is the beginning of killing the spirit of the music. And so uh, I think B.B. King used to say if he didn't make mistakes uh, in a a night it wasn't a good night, that his best nights were nights that he made a lot of mistakes because he was pushing himself, he was challenging himself. And I think we all kind of look at it now, or, or those of us who love improv, look at it now like uh, you can't critique yourself while you're playing. If you do that, you're not really performing at your your at your best. The best you can ever perform is when you shut your brain off and let go and just do what uh, comes naturally. And, and, you know, that sounds stupid, it sounds cliche, and it's also easier said than done. But some version of that, uh, the best you can do it on a night-by-night -night basis, is really effective. You, you, you very rarely can do it 100%, and when that happens, those are beautiful nights. Now, early in your career, you, you put in some time working as a session singer and guitarist in Nashville, which, and in that setting, obviously, you can't, you can't take that approach. 
So how quickly did it become apparent to you that probably for the reasons you just stated that that wasn't a good fit for you? Well, let's, let's go all the way back. I, I grew up listening to a lot of wonderful music based on the fact that I had two older brothers that had great taste in music, turned me on to a lot of great music. But I, throughout my career, I've taken one step at a time. If there was an opportunity, I took it, made the best of it. That led me to another opportunity. To another opportunity. So when I joined David Allen Coe's band uh, when I was 19 or 20, it was the strangest opportunity ever. I didn't know anything about his music. I didn't know anything about him or his lifestyle. Uh, but it was a step up. And so I took the step up, and it wound up being how I met Dickie Betts and Greg Allman. Uh, which eventually would lead me to joining Dickie Betts' band, which would lead me to joining the Allman Brothers. In the meantime, I had found myself in this world of uh, country music, but what they call outlaw country music, where it's not mainstream, it's not commercial. And I was learning a lot from being surrounded by that, and especially since I've always had this love for singer-songwriters. So the next step was move to Nashville. That's closer than New York. That's closer than Los Angeles. So I, mo I moved to Nashville at 23 years old with the hopes of becoming a studio musician. And I got there and started realizing it's pretty hard. Uh, I have a lot, a lot of work ahead of me. I have a lot to learn. Things started falling in place. I started doing better and better and starting garnering some attention and, and uh, building some sort of reputation. Coincidentally, about the same time, I started realizing, you know, I don't like this. It's, it's really taking all the personality out of music. So somewhere around age 26, I decided uh, this, is a, this is a bad choice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to what I was doing, which was just writing songs for myself and brings us back to the very beginning of the, of the conversation. I wanted to be either a solo artist or a, in a band where I was the singer-songwriter or one of the singer-songwriters. That's when I made that choice based on the fact that playing cookie-cutter music was not meant for me. Uh, com company Man <laughs> is one, one of the most... Uh, moving songs to me on the on this record. It, uh, was that written about your father? It was, yes. And um, did seeing him, uh, you know, go through everything he did and have that work ethic and, and working so hard? Do you think that's where you got your work ethic from? We over these years, you know, people have called you the hardest working man in rock, and you've done these shows where you're playing seven hours, and you were playing with the Dead and the Almer Brothers, and opening the show solo and. Do you, I mean, do you view yourself, or have you viewed yourself over the years as partly a working man, and this is well, what you do? I, I was quoted before saying, I appreciate the whole hardest working man in show business thing, but I don't work as hard as most housewives. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I damn sure don't work as hard as my dad did. And, and, uh, but... I do feel that I kind of inherited his work ethic. You know, he was, uh, and my dad's still alive. He's 81. Uh, but he uh, he had a lot of integrity. You know, he, uh, he grew up in the mountains of North Carolina. He worked for a company his whole life that 20-something uh, years later uh, decided to shut down in the southeast, and they gave him the choice of moving to another part of the world uh, or starting over. And he chose starting over. And uh, I really always respected him even more for that decision because I know he, he looked at it like, I can get another job, but I can't get another home. You know, and, and this is my home. And, and it was really a gift to you and, and your brothers. And you look how rooted you guys are now. Uh, yeah. 30 years, 40 years later, or Yeah, whatever, he, he didn't Nashville. want to cart us around the world looking for a, a new place to live and another job that may or may not take place, you know? And I think we all owe him a thanks, too, because you... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, uh, 
you had a um, you had an opportunity to go to college, I think, on a on a full academic scholarship. I right? did, yeah. And it, I know it meant a lot to so him for you to too do good that. To be true, but yeah. yeah, it meant a, it would have meant a lot for him to him for you to do that because you would have been, I think, the first guy in your family to go to school. And he eventually gave you your his blessing to run out on the road with David Allen Coe instead, right? He knew that I wanted to pursue music. Uh, and uh, when he found out that I was offered a scholarship, uh, I, I was scared to tell him because I knew he was excited, uh, uh, would be excited about it. And uh, he said, what, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to play music. And he, he got pretty quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, uh, well, then that's what you should do. And so, yeah, I, I had his blessing. So you all need to send uh, Mr. Haynes a thank you note for having this. Um, and and uh, anybody who, uh, who's had the opportunity to go down to your Christmas jam, which is 26 years now, right? 26 years yeah. we've yeah. done it. So I know a lot of people here have done it. I'm sure people watching. It's an incredible event, and, and you've raised well over a million dollars, right, for Habitat for Humanity. Can you, for those who don't know, could you describe a little bit what that is? And um, I just, you know, it's an you're talking about your roots in Asheville, and you've certainly given back, and, and the, the hometown feeling there, and the way your old friends are running transportation and catering and everything, it's, it's really an incredible thing. Well, Christmas Jam started in 1988 in a small club as an opportunity for the local musicians to get together and hang out and, and play music together at the only time of year that it seemed like all of us were there, which was uh, Christmas holidays. So we weren't really looking to raise tons of money. We were just looking to, to hang out and have fun and play music together. And, and what money we did raise, we would donate it to a charity. Then uh, it got bigger, then it got bigger, and then uh, it moved to a theater, and then we outgrew the theater, and then the past, I guess, uh, I don't know, 15 years or more, I don't, I don't know, we've been at the, the Civic Center there, uh, which holds uh, 7,200 people, and uh, it, it organically turned into a, a national event. I guess, in some ways, I should point out that um, we were in this club, and the security was really bad. And uh, this is when people like Derek Trucks and Alan Woody uh, and Edwin McCain and Kevin Kinney and people like that would come before it had turned into a bigger event. Uh, someone stole Derek Trucks' guitar out of the dressing room and uh, my wife Stephanie said, that's it, we're, we're moving it out of the club, we're gonna go to a bigger, uh, venue and turn it into a national event and she was right it was the right thing to do someone called my brother and said i know who has derek's guitar and they they don't want to go to jail they just want to return it <laughs> so we said no questions asked and they brought the guitar back which was great uh and the next year we started making phone calls and made the lineup better and the next year even better and it kind of uh, turned into this thing where so many wonderful artists have been part of it from all over the world. And, and that also points out one of your other great skills, I think, which is to have, take any, seemingly, any <laughs> group of musicians on stage and turn it into something great rather than chaotic. And we've seen you do it over and over every year at Christmas Jam, at the Deepest End concerts. Uh, at the Beacon, I mean, at the Allman Brothers Beacon shows, you were really the guy responsible for it becoming what it did in terms of so many guests. Is that accurate? Well, uh, what's the question? Uh, yeah, <laughs> as a, as a, did the whole guest <laughs> thing at the at the Beacon develop? Is that a, is that a Warren thing? Um, you know, I've I've always in, enjoyed uh, spontaneous music that happens on stage that people are seeing and hearing for the first time that they've never seen or heard before. I've always felt like if I go to a show and, and see that, uh, it's inspiring. And so us trying to give that back has always been uh, part of the equation. 
uh, I've gotten better and better through the years at being able to kind of think about the strengths of uh, the different musicians. And a lot of it's picking the right song for the, the musicians to play and then trying to control the chaos, but also trying to not control the chaos and just let it be what it's going to be and control it if you have to. Um, musicians that share this kind of philosophy tend to thrive on this sort of playing. So those of us who love this, uh, it's not as far-fetched and outlandish as it may appear to some people. Right. But you, and you also brought into the Allman Brothers the idea of changing set lists so much because at the end of your first tenure in the Allman Brothers, you and Woody were getting kind of frustrated with the limited set list where there was like an ABC set list, right? So when you came back, that was part of what you brought along, right? Well, even going back before that, um, uh, Kirk West, who you know, who was the, the tour manager with the Allman Brothers for a long time, uh, was talking to me and to Alan Woody and uh, eventually to Greg about, this is going back in the 90s, about the fact that we were starting to do multiple nights in places and, and starting to have uh, a lot of fans follow the band in a way that was similar to the Grateful Dead. And uh, we would probably benefit from the fact that the set list could change on a nightly basis and take a cue from the dead in that way. The Allman Brothers in the old days didn't change the set that much. So we all started talking about it uh, back then with with Dickie and, and myself and and everyone about you know it being good for the audience if if we would do this and there, there's actually a, a I just remembered a, a funny story we, we were Greg and I were talking at rehearsal and we were trying to sell everyone on the idea and uh, what that meant was not playing some of the more popular songs every night playing a few of them but not all of them and so Greg turned to me and said, hey, uh, Haynes, you wouldn't care if we didn't play One Way Out every night, would you? And I said, man, I was tired of playing that song before I ever met you guys. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> and I, w I was joking. Uh, but, but I played that song in every bar band, every garage band, every nightclub band. That's one of those songs, right? And I never wanted to play it again until I started playing with the Allman Brothers. When you play it with the Allman Brothers, it's like, wow. This is one way out. This is the way it's meant to be played. But I was being facetious and saying, yeah, we, we, could, we could skip them every now and then. You know? <laughs> and there's enough songs that you, know, you might not get one way out, but you're going to get enough. Yeah, every you're time. always going to get enough of the classics to make a good show, or ho hopefully, you know. Because what is a great Allman Brothers show? If you ask 10 people, they're going to tell you 10 different things. We always talked about how some people were more into the instrumentals and the jam. Some people were more into the songs like Midnight Rider and Melissa. Uh, and so the people that went to the bathroom during Melissa were not the people that went to the bathroom during A Memory of Elizabeth Reed. Uh, so... I always maintain, and I, I, I still uh, try to utilize this philosophy with Government Mule and, and with uh, my other projects, it's a balance between the two that's the most important. If you have great songs, which the Allman Brothers uh, uh, catalog is full of, then you also, in, in the case of the Allman Brothers or someone like the Grateful Dead, you also have this uh, improvisation. One without the other is not nearly as effective as the blend of the two and the right balance. And I think you told me at one point that the, that the Allman Brothers, a couple of year or two ago, you had a repertoire maybe of about 100 songs. And Government Mule, I think you said about 300. So what does Warren Haynes have? What do you, how many songs do you, could you take a guitar and feel comfortable playing at any given time? Well, you, let's describe repertoire uh, <laughs> or define repertoire. Government Mule has probably played way over a thousand songs. Some of them only once. Some of them not very well. Uh, um, we couldn't play however many songs are in our repertoire without 
kind of brushing up on some of them. Most of them we probably could. But again, you go back to the, we're not striving for perfection. We're trying to get as much emotion in the music as possible. Uh, I don't know how many songs uh, that I know or, or could play. I'm sure it's well in the thousands, but I, I can clarify that by saying I'm not going to be playing them the way someone else played them or the way they're written or with with any degree of perfection. Playing music is about being able to blend into what everybody else is doing and be part of it. And if I don't know the next chord, then I lay out and don't right. play it, you know. But but one big difference, you know, 20, the government mule just celebrated. But you can't do that in government mule, cause especially when we were a trio. Yeah. <laughs> If I yeah, <laughs> but I mean, in the original government mule, if I laid out, it was bass solo. Yeah, <laughs> which was fine with Woody, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, government mule, you just celebrated your 20th anniversary, so congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank but, you. Thank you. One, one of the big differences in those 20 years is, you know, tw tw when you guys were starting out and playing smaller clubs and whatever, if you felt like playing a cover for the first time. It was awesome for whoever was there, and nobody really probably was going to hear it again. There'd be some tapers and the hardcore fans that would circulate around. But now, everything you do, before you're back on your bus, it's on YouTube. So does that affect your fearlessness of, of trying stuff at all? I think the fact that we have graduated from where we started to where we are makes it okay. If, if I were a band that was starting out now knowing that people were going to be posting every moment of your life on on YouTube, I would probably be a little more reluctant to take as many chances. But this is what we do. We're used to it. We, we, it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, it goes back to uh, when the Allman Brothers started allowing people to tape the shows and trade the tapes, which is another uh, Grateful Dead uh, uh part of their model. And another Kirk West. Uh, and that in, was something that Kirk pushed for as yeah. well. Um, Government Mule did that from the very beginning. Uh, we allowed people to, to tape and to trade the shows. Uh, but there weren't cell phones back then, you know. And, and I'm, still, I'm still cool with people recording and, and trading the tapes and, and everything. You know, I, I would never second guess our policies, but it is a little annoying to see on YouTube some just horrible quality version <laughs> of something that you can't understand it, you can't hear it, it looks terrible, it sounds terrible, whatever it is, and, and somebody's proud of it because they, you know, they did it and, you know, but somebody on the other side of the world is looking at that as some sort of representation of what you do, and I think that's a little strange. Yeah. Uh, I think what I'm saying is if you're gonna, if you're gonna post stuff, a little more quality control. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. um, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, that Derek told me, uh, and, and it was that one of the things that could be frustrating for you guys in the Allman Brothers is if there was a dispute, it usually was 45 years old and had nothing to do with you or him. Absolutely. But you would be dragged into it. So, I mean, was that just a difficult dynamic at times to, to maneuver through? I think every band that has survived the 60s, 70s, probably even 80s. I didn't, I didn't care much for most of the 80s bands, so I don't know. <laughs> but uh, any band that survived what you have to go through to uh, accomplish that, they all... I mean, you got to think about, especially the bands in the 60s and 70s, it was a very experimental time. These people were really young. Uh, they got hurled into something that they weren't prepared for. And they all were like a, a gang going through everything together. And years later, uh, some sort of compressed version of that is still embedded in everybody's head. And so in every band from that period I've ever met, it, at the drop of a hat, somebody could go, in 1971, you remember you did this? And, 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 like, and just like have some flashback about something that happened, and the rest of us are going, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. uh, but 
That's part of it. I think, you know, imagine your family and then multiply that by right. some weird uh, algorithm. Well, right. And another part of that family dynamic is, you know, if you're the younger brother, as we both are, <laughs> you're always the younger brother. So now we're, we're adults, you got kids, and, you know, you got a good career response. But you're still, to some extent, your brothers are going to treat you like the kid, right? So Yeah. And that's the same thing in, in the band, right? You can be in the Allman Brothers 25 years, but you're still but the I'm kid. But I'm the new guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. I mean, that means they lasted 45 years, and, and I think that's great, you know. I thank you so much. Thank you, Warren. I think um, I think we're going to open it up to some questions from the crowd now. Okay. Oh, there's a crowd here. <laughs> Hello. Uh, you know, I guess since you asked me, I have to be truthful about that. Uh, New Year's Eve. I think the song stands on its own. If you don't know what it's about, it still has a, it's a meaningful song because all of us, uh, it, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day is a time of reflection, of trying to think about making your life better and what you've done wrong and what you want to do better. Uh, I had a childhood friend who died on New Year's Eve. And uh, for years or decades, that's what I thought about on New Year's Eve. And so I wrote a song about it, but I wrote it in an abstract way where you didn't have to know that part. Uh, but it, it's written for a friend of mine who passed away. He was a singer, songwriter, guitar player that I, that I knew since I was probably 13 or 14 or something like that. And uh, so it, it's a very... Uh, personal song for me but it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be listened to that way because I think we all look at at, at uh, reflection the same way I'm sorry to hear that when well, anybody that's lost a loved one on a holiday knows what I mean when you say that holiday will never be the same from that point forward um, she's got the the microphone in the back there to... I oh. Um, is there anything um, in your life that you've ever written or even played that you have a favorite of? Anything that sticks out in particular that you really love playing the most? Uh, no, I, you know, someone asked me uh, actually earlier today in an interview if I had a favorite song on Ashes and Dust, and I don't, I can't even choose that. Uh, it, it's hard for me to choose a, a favorite. The, they're all on that record because they're my favorites and I included them for that reason. There are songs that are more dear to my heart and more personal, like she brought up New Year's Eve. Uh, Alan brought up Company Man, which is about my father. So those songs that, that are about real life stories and real human beings are a lot of times my favorite, but uh, I guess it changes day by day, you know. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Thanks for uh, opening up yourself and the great the graciousness of uh, this interview. I appreciate it. And uh, Alan, you. you did a great job. It was very, you. very seamless uh, interview. Awesome. I, a question on your your um the photos for your uh, Ashes and Dust uh, CD and album. I noticed it was. I just like the mood of it. it, it turquoise and and the photos are different on the CD and the album. And I, I didn't see a credit of where where it was taken. I was just wondering the thought process when you want to, you know, make a visual impact on your album. How do you how do you go through that, and, and where is the place, and how'd you pick it? Uh, Danny Clinch was the photographer, and he picked that place. Uh, and when we walked in, we just had this vibe that uh, um, right away I felt like was conducive to the music, and it's it's uh, Brooklyn Queens. I think it was in Queens. Uh, I had never been there before, but there's a lot of pictures uh, in this one room that had all these mirrors, and they were all antique mirrors in a frame, and uh, and all the all the shots, like the one that people say, why are you left-handed? It's because it's a picture of the mirror. Uh, but there's a lot of mirror shots and stuff, and 
Uh, I really credit Danny as being the vibe of, of that artwork. You know, he uh, he's such an amazing photographer and a, a great friend as well. Um, in some cases, we go into uh, approaching the artwork with a, a an already established idea. In some cases, we just look at the photos and, and see what happens, and that's what happened with this artwork. Uh, we were so... Uh, struck by the imagery that we decided to make that the, the, the artistic theme of the record. Back here. Warren, I have in my hand an audio cassette sampler tape that was... you threw to me from the stage <laughs> of Wetlands in 1995. <laughs> Still intact all these years. I, did, I didn't hit you, did I? I wouldn't have felt it anyway, but I'm curious. So you were at Wetlands. <laughs> Just what your uh, memory is of playing those small clubs back in 94, 95, as compared to the Allman Brothers and the, the bigness of that. Just what your memories are of that. Well, uh, let's start with Wetlands. I mean, what a great place that was. Um, when I came, I came to New York in... Uh, 89, and I still remember myself and Alan Woody and Greg Allman, the three of us went to this place called Wetlands after a show one night, and it was like, wow, what, what decade is it? Uh, uh, the music was great, the atmosphere was great, it was very eco-friendly, uh, the people were, were wonderful, and, and that became my new haunt, my new place to hang out. When we started uh, Government Mule, you know, it was a side project uh, for me and Alan Woody. We were full-time members of the Allman Brothers, so we were just looking for some, something fun to do. We didn't really have the ambition or the aspirations of, of making Government Mule some big thing. Uh, we, we were going to make a, an experimental record. I don't even think we intended to tour when we first started. We just thought we'd play a few shows and that would be it. But it kind of caught fire a little bit and we realized we had some chemistry and there started becoming an audience for it. Uh, as Alan mentioned earlier, those early days when we were playing in a club with a few hundred people, they were very experimental times, but they were also low pressure. You know, we could experiment on stage because there wasn't a big audience there. And, and so a lot of the stuff that happened, a lot of the most cathartic moments and the most um, uh, music-changing moments for us were in front of really small crowds. Uh, and, and so I, I look back fondly. That's why I wanted to release some of those old shows. And one of them that is really dear to our hearts is this show that we did in Nashville, Georgia in 1995 uh, to about 50 people. And we recorded it and we just recently re remixed it and are gonna put it out. And it was a, one of those shows that changed the, traje the trajectory of, of our music um, at a time when we were changing all the time. But I, I appreciate you asking about that. Those are wonderful days. Th those early government mule shows were just fantastic. And I think anybody who, any, anybody who was in the room for, for any of them, you know, was probably also changed and, and you know, everything else sounded a little tame after that. <laughs> you know, I, I also went back recently and uh, with Gordy Johnson, we remixed what was going to be the first Government Mule record, which kind of turned into demos before we made the first Government Mule record. Um, and I think we're going to release that. It was, uh, it was very raw. Uh, it was Government Mule in its infancy. And when I hear it now, it reminds me of, of the chemistry and what made us want to be a, a real band, what, what we thought that we had that was special. And uh, I think... Uh, the remix sounds amazing. I think we're going to probably release that stuff as well, which I'm, I'm very happy about. Yeah. Um, I've seen you a lot of times, and you were actually my first concert when I was five years old. Sorry. I'm really nervous. Um, and I just want to say... 
Um, I just want to know how um, you prepare for each show. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, because you, like, how do you prepare for that mentally and physically? Like, how do you, when you put it all on the stage, how do you prepare for that? Well, a big part of the preparation is uh, putting together the set list and trying to figure out what it is that we're going to play. Some of that we wait until after sound check to try to determine what the vibe in the room is going to be like, especially if it's a, a, a place we've never played before. Uh, we also keep a log of every show we've ever done, so when we go back to a certain city, we want to make sure to play a completely different show than we played the last time we were there. Um, it's nice to have some time to yourself and kind of just not talk and not socialize a little bit right before the show. But I've also noticed sometimes when I'm not allowed that the show doesn't really suffer. It's just really me being selfish and wanting time to myself. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's no preparation other than like a, when you're playing a sport, you're just trying to pump yourself up, you know. And people always ask, uh, are you, do you get nervous? Well, yeah, we get nervous, but it's more of an anticipation. It's more of like this anxiousness to let's get it on with. Let's, let's, let's go on stage and play, you know. Warren, since you were talking about the vibe of the room and setting the, the set list. Do you sometimes get started and realize that you've just made a bad call? The set list doesn't fit and just audible, <laughs> just start changing it? Like, wait, Absolutely. this isn't what I thought it was. Absolutely. Um, in the same way that when you have a really good night, a really special night, it happens from the, from the very beginning. You walk on stage right in the first 30 seconds, it feels amazing and you know you're going to have a great night. The opposite of that can be true uh, as well. Uh, and when that happens, we usually wind up somewhere in the middle of the first few songs, just kind of having a little powwow among ourselves on stage and going, we got to do something different. You know, this isn't feeling right. But hopefully people don't pick up on that and, uh, you know, our, our goal has always been for your, your good nights to be great and for your bad nights to be good. That's what you hope for. That's, that's an admirable goal. <laughs> Warren, um, I was wondering at what point in the process when you go in the studio, do you start thinking how the songs are going to translate to the stage, where there's room for the songs to grow, where the, what's on the album is really what you want to present to a live audience? At, at what point in the process are you thinking about that? I guess it varies from song to song. Uh, with some songs, I'm not, I'm not so concerned with how they're going to translate on stage. You just want to capture them the best you can in the studio and worry about that later. Uh, with some of the other songs... You start thinking about, uh, especially the some of the middle sections, some of the solo sections and instrumentals, uh, leaving room for growth and, and seeing, you know, n knowing that they're going to expand, but not forcing them to expand right then, knowing that six months, a year later, something will happen that'll uh, open that up. Um, for the most part, you know, it, it's funny. I, I I'm I'm kind of digressing, but in the way that Alan was talking about the modern approach to recording and our approach to recording, um, I guess most modern music, they're trying to figure out how to take what they did in the studio and perform it live, where we're trying to take what we know we can do on stage and capture it in the studio. You know what I mean? Hi, how are you? Um, I'm with Emule. We've been around 20 years celebrating as well. Um, there's probably some folks here. Um, that was all about live music, but I do have a studio question for you. There was an interview I saw with uh, Rodney Mills, engineer, and he was saying, funny story with Sweet Home Alabama with Turn It Up. It was actually Ronnie Van Zant saying to turn up the music in the headphones. Yes, I've heard that. Do you that. have any, like, 
inside any kind of great story like that of anything that made it to tape that kind of wasn't expecting that just kind of ended up happening? We've heard a million times, but never really knew the story behind. Well, uh, can I cuss? Uh, fine, with, fine with me. Um, okay, so <laughs> why am I asking you? Yeah, I, don't uh, <laughs> I don't know. So, um, yeah, we were just talking about uh, these early government mule demos that were going to be the, the first record before we decided to uh, make the first record differently. Um, the song that appears on the very first uh, government mule record called uh, Left Coast Groovies, at the beginning, there's this little quieter, it sounds like us rehearsing the song, sort of, and then it sort of falls apart, and then you hear someone, I don't know who, and in the background say, what the fuck? And, um, <laughs> and I remembered, but I was reminded recently that that came from those early demos when we were learning the songs. We took a tape of that moment and put it before the song starts. And so I found that when I was looking at the, the old demos and, and thought, oh yeah, that's where that came from, you know. <laughs> Well, it's not, it's not exactly the same, but a story you told me that's in One Way Out that I thought was cool was when you guys were recording Seven Turns, the Allman Brothers, you were doing, you and Dickie, I guess, were working on vocal harmonies, and Greg was just shooting pool yeah. and, and heard you guys and, you know, started singing that counterpoint. Yeah. Somebody's, you know. That's and, right. And we that were, uh, Dickie and, and myself and Johnny Neal were we're working on the, the background vocals uh, and recording the background vocals at, at the end of Seven Turns. Somebody's calling your name, all that stuff. And I walked by the lounge, and Greg was in there shooting pool, and he, he would hear, like, our voices go, somebody's calling your name, and he'd go, somebody's calling your name. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ran in the studio and I said, Dickie, come here, you got to hear this. <laughs> and uh, I said, Greg was just answering us and it sounded amazing. Yeah. And I, I think we, we better go put that on there. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm glad you remembered that. Hey there. Hi. How are you feeling? Great. <laughs> How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. So we've seen you all over the world, and we have the best souvenir from a government mule show. We got a little girl named Melody that we brought home from Island Exodus a couple years ago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. She's 10 months old now, so we'll be back to Exodus in 17. But here's my question. Where is the most peaceful place on earth to you? Because you've got such craziness all the time. So where do you find the most peace? Oh, a good question. You know, um, if it weren't so far away, I would spend more time in Maui, I think. Uh, it's, it, people on the West Coast have it easy because that's only a five or six hour flight for them, but it's like 12 hours for us. But I, I really in, enjoyed staying there. I thought it was extremely peaceful. Uh, my wife and I spent a few days uh, in Portofino in Italy when we were in the middle of a tour, and that was pretty peaceful as well, but it was only a few days. Um, but, you know, you take peace where you find it, I guess. You know, uh, being home can be peaceful, or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for your questions, and uh, Warren, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure.